Well, great. Shall we get started? Sounds good. All right. Well, hello and welcome, everybody. My name is David Nidell, and I'm the Asia Program Advisor for the Environmental Leadership and Training Initiative, or LT, hired through C4 ECRAF. I'm joined today by my colleague Jillian Bloomfield from LT's online program. LT is an initiative of Yale University School of the Environment, which receives generous support from Arcadia, a charitable fund of Elizabeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. We're pleased to welcome you today to the final webinar in our eight-part webinar series, Forest and Landscape Restoration in Practice. Throughout the series, we've been celebrating the experiences and perspectives of alumni of LT's 15 years of capacity development and training. Today, we're very pleased to be joined by three LT alumni, Emma van de Ven and Ino Walter from Rabobank in the Netherlands, and they'll be presenting together, and Mary Osman from Forest Carbon in Indonesia. Emma and Ina were participants in LT's 2021 online course entitled Tropical Forest Restoration and Agroforestry, while Mary participated in LT's online certificate program in 2020 and 2021. The title of today's webinar is Carbon Markets and Forest Land Use Change. Carbon markets for, agri for agriculture, forestry, and other land uses emerged as a major potential funding stream, particularly following the Bali Climate Change Conference in 2008. The carbon markets have been through a lot of innovations in terms of the development of carbon measurement methodologies, standards for addressing concerns of permanence, leakage, and additionality, but there have also been false starts and obstacles to project implementation. With recent advances in carbon markets, it will be great to see how these two projects have been developed. Our hope is that these two presentations can provide both insights and inspiration about how carbon markets can finance on the ground change. Some logistics first. To avoid, to avoid issues with connectivity and to provide access to subtitles, today's speakers have kindly pre-recorded their short presentations. We'll hear both of the presentations and then have a chance for a short discussion all together afterwards. This session is being recorded and will be sent out by email in the next few days. It will also be posted to LT's YouTube channel. Also feel free to take a look at the chat where Jillian and I will be posting relevant links and resources. So we'll start with Emma and Ina first. Emma and Ina both work for Rabobank's ACORN program, which stands for Agroforestry Carbon Removal Units for the Organic Restoration of Nature. Rabobank is a Dutch multinational banking and financial services company headquartered in Utrecht, Netherlands. Emma is a strategy lead and Ina is a senior account manager. Emma's main career motivation has been building successful business models that help create a healthier world, while Ina has over 20 years of work experience in the coffee sector. Last October, both participated in an LT online short course called Tropical Forest Restoration and Agroforestry. While Jillian gets the video up, we welcome you, Emma and Ina, to activate your microphones if you'd like to say something. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Thank you for having us. And we look forward to the discussions. Hi, this is Ina. Thank you, David, for such a nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we feel very honored. And we hope we can answer all the questions after the presentations are done. So I'm Ina Walter. I am with Rabobank. I've been working in the coffee sector in East Africa for the last 20 years. Um, Emma and myself took the LT course on agroforestry uh, last November. And I'm going to hand over to Emma now. So hi, uh, I'm Emma van der Ven. I've uh, also been part of the same agroforestry course together with uh, a whole lot of our other colleagues at Rabobank and um, have no background in agroforestry. So this was a great introduction and I'm very happy to share the work we are doing uh, on this topic. And I'll be happy to give a quick introduction before Ina explains more about the in-depth impact of what we do at Rabobank uh, on a farmer level. 
So bear with me while I share my slides. So um, welcome to this presentation on ACORN. ACORN is a Rabobank project that focuses on agroforestry um, and uses carbon removal units, as we call them, carbon credits, um, for the organic restoration of nature. So Rabobank is a global uh, agricultural bank and has a big network in agriculture. And therefore also the goals of Rabobank are much aligned with agricultural challenges. Um, the challenges Rabobank sees uh, in its areas, land degradation, food insecurity and climate change for the farmers and specifically the smallholder farmers in our client network. What we also see is that the carbon market is designed to build uh, a method where large emitters worldwide relocate their money to the victims of climate change. However, um, we see that within the carbon market, there is a lot of different um, quality when it comes to carbon credits. You have emission allowance, which is uh, a classic uh, trading scheme within countries. Between countries, you have emission avoidance and or reduction, um, which are very familiar avoided deforestation credits, for example. And then you have emission sequestration or carbon removal, where actual CO2 is taken out of the air. Um, ACORN says basically we need reduction, and that's the first goal. And for any excess CO2 emissions that cannot be reduced, we only can use uh, emission sequestration or removal because we really need to go negative to reach net zero. So ACORN does not believe carbon credits are the end all be all solution. We see emission removal as the highest quality of credits uh, as a last resort after reduction has taken place. The reason for that is that you can see here in this schematic overview of how a tree grows um, that over the first couple of years of tree growth, and of course these numbers vary a lot per species and per climatic circumstance, we see that a lot of CO2 is taken out of the air and sequestered into that tree. And then after a tree is stabilized, let's say in an agroforestry system um, where it's, it's pruned to keep a certain size, then the growth phase ends. And what ACORN does, we sell carbon credits over the growth phase. So for each year, there's a delta in biomass. We measure that with remote sensing and we create carbon removal units that we can sell on behalf of these farmers. In the orange circle on the right, you can see that 80 to 90 percent of the, the revenues of those credits go straight to the uh, smaller farmers involved, which is an, uh, a very high number looking at the carbon standard. Uh, these credits are sold for at least 20 euros per ton CO2, so significantly more expensive than the earlier mentioned uh, avoided emission credits. However, we see that there's a lot of traction for those types of credits because also uh, in a buyer's market, there's more awareness on credits that are of higher quality. Then, of course, I don't have to tell you about the benefits of agroforestry, but specifically for smallholders who really need the diversity and not just nutrients, but also in uh, in their income. It is really important that diversification of land use uh, for them leads to a much better balanced uh, business. Now you can wonder why those smaller farmers haven't been part of the carbon market yet when carbon credits can so easily pay for this transition. Um, there's a high monitoring cost and a high certification cost classically involved with any carbon project. Monitoring costs are often uh, attributed to CO2 measurements. So being able to use remote sensing, like I mentioned before, really scales up the proposition in a way that we don't have to be on the ground to measure each and every farmer's plot, but we can use any sort of remote sensing data and our very smart machine learning algorithms to uh, quantify the sequestered carbon year on year in complex ecosystems like agroforestry on very small plots. I'm very proud of the technology that we've developed for this because it's uh, unique in the market. Next to that, we also see the high certification costs that are uh, associated with any carbon project. And it's not just certification costs, it's also the external validator. And for each new project, you have to start up costs as well. ACORN deals with this by uh, addressing those costs in a very innovative way, really challenging 
the standards for a quality credit in the certification market and adapting that to the needs of smallholder farmers who have been previously overlooked for clear reasons. So all in all, what ACORN does, we concern us with the grey box in the middle, where we function as a connector between the local partners working with the farmers and on the demand side, the corporates wanting to buy carbon credits. We don't just set high standards for our farmers and local partners. We also set high standards for our corporates who have to at least done a very public job of uh, showing their emission reduction efforts and they have to be significant before they can even qualify as buyers for ACORN. So we don't just uh, level up the standard for the carbon market. We also uh, raise the standard for the buyers in this market. So what we do is we enable the transactions, we measure all the CO2, we store it on our platform and our registry, and we ensure payments from the emitters to the sequesters. And for that, I think Ina can tell much more of the impact that makes on these smallholder farmer lives. Okay, so uh, now from Emma's a bit more theoretical background onto what actually happens on the ground. Um, and uh, we had several pilots uh, last year, one of them uh, being a cooperative uh, of coffee farmers in Tanzania. Uh, the cooperative has 20,000 members. We did the pilot with 2,000 uh, farmer families. Uh, the cooperative is based in the north of Tanzania. You can see the little circle and the arrow pointing um, at Kagera. And uh, this is in the lowlands, but then moving up. So the elevation goes quite high, still Robusta coffee uh, in the Lake Victoria um, region. And um, what happens, and you can see this in the timeline uh, just above the picture, uh, these are the steps that we take to onboard farmers on the platform that Emma was just showing you in the scheme. Uh, so there's farmer data collected, uh, then there's the plots being uploaded on the platform. Uh, we go into ground truth uh, collection. This has to do with um, the satellites and um, the remote sensing that Emma was explaining earlier, so I will explain a bit uh, after that. Uh, then we have the model in place and at the very least then we calculate the crews and there's a payout to the farmers. So you can see in the pictures um, how the data was collected on the farms. We've put these pictures together a little bit, but you can see uh, the lead farmers, uh, the extension is explaining um, how to do it uh, and the farmers uh, collecting the data. In the example of Caderas, then this was uploaded to uh, the platform. You can see a little screenshot here. Uh, then we uh, need to collect ground truth data. For that, we define sample plots, uh, 100 um, of one, one hectare each. Um, and then on the sample plots, it's uh, quite detailed data that needs to be collected, including tree species, height, diameter, um, etc. And all of this data then is um, translated uh, into above ground biomass. Here you can see how in the case of Caderas the ground truth data was collected um, and how the trees were measured. In addition uh, we flew LIDAR um, and if anybody's interested I'm sure in the Q&A we can go into this in, in a bit more detail. Uh, I'm moving up in the uh, little timeline as you can see above. So now we're in the model in place. So the data which is collected um, needs to be cleaned um, and then a measurement request is sent. Uh, and at the last then we are uh, at all these beautiful little images which I'm not going to go into detail now. Um, but this is uh, satellite data and LIDAR, we're checking for deforestation going backwards uh, five years, making sure that there was no deforestation on the plots. 
Um, and then crews are calculated. You can see this here. It's a screenshot of the platform. Um, and you can check um, how many crews each farmer was able um, to sequester. And here we see just one example of a family um, of the Caderas Cooperative in northern Tanzania. Uh, this family has 2.2 hectare under agroforestry. You can see left and right. Uh, we tried to take pictures of, of the trees. Um, they generated 28 carbon removal units and received uh, just last week about 500 euros. So with, the, with this, I hope we're still in the 10 minutes. Okay. Right. Okay, thank you so much, Emma and Ina, for that great synopsis of the ACORN program. It's especially inspiring to see that you're able to overcome the challenges to including large numbers of smallholders in the program. Next, we'll hear from Mary Osman. Mary is Director of Legal Affairs and Compliance for the Forest Carbon in Indonesia. Mary is a trained lawyer with a background in business and environmental law in Indonesia. She holds a law degree from Atma Jaya University and an LLM from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and is a member of the Indonesian Bar Association. She's worked on legal issues for a variety of other organizations, including the Indonesian Red Plus Agency, the UNDP, and the Indonesian Netherlands Association, and has advised on land tenure and licensing strategies for multiple NGOs, including FFI, Winrock, and the IFC. As mentioned, Mary participated in LT's 2021 delivery of the Tropical Forest Landscapes Online Certificate Program. As she will mention in the video, the program helped expand her knowledge and in particular helped her to reflect on the many social aspects of conservation and restoration and enhance her project's approach to community engagement. So Mary, if you would like to say hi while uh, Jillian gets the video ready. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here and um, looking forward to having discussion with you all. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mary Osman. Uh, I work for Forest Carbon. Uh, my connection to LT is I'm LT alumna. I, I participate in the program in 2020 until 2021. Uh, today, uh, I'll be representing uh, about securing investment for peatland restoration project. Um, so before I share uh, about uh, our peatland restoration project uh, and also uh, how we secure the investment, I want to give an overview about uh, the company Forest Carbon. So Forest Carbon is a forest restoration and a conservation company uh, founded in 2007. Uh, we have registered offices in Singapore and Jakarta. So we have 10 years track record designing forest conservation project under VCS and CCD standard. Uh, we launched uh, our first pitland restoration project in 2016. Uh, it's called uh, SMPP or Sumatra Marang Pitland Project. Uh, generate uh, 1.3 million carbon credits annually over 47 years and first verified in 2019 and successfully selling carbon credits. So uh, we also have work on a project across the region, Indonesia, Malaysia, Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam. We also have professional team with high capacity in-house conservation, forestry, IT, programming, uh, remote sensing, GIS, research, and legal capacity. Uh, the vision of the company is uh, become a project development company in Southeast Asia. So um, Forest Carbon is a, a project developer, SMPP. Uh, the project is uh, located in Musi Banyu Asin District, South Sumatra Province, uh, restored 23,000 uh, hectare uh, degraded peatland forest. Uh, since we first uh, launched our project in 2016, uh, the forest cover increased from 1% to 24% uh, by the end of 2020. Uh, the area also home of uh, endangered and threatened species, uh, uh, including Sumatran tiger, sun bear, and also hornbill. So uh, the project our, our, our objective on uh, climate mitigation is avoided uh, feedland em emission through the protection and rehabilitation of the project site. Uh, so far, we uh, we built a uh, 203 uh, canal blocks, and we also have a fire prevention activities. Uh, we conduct forest uh, patrol regularly. Uh, we also uh, conduct a training with uh, local community on fire prevention. Uh, 
uh, our approach to the project is assisted natural generation. We have uh, enrichment planting and also tree nursery uh, across the project area. The project also employ local staff. So far, we have uh, approximately four, uh, 40 local staff in, in, in the project. Uh, and then we also invest uh, significantly into the health and education system of neighboring communities into villages, uh, Marang village and also Kapayang village. And then our health uh, program, uh, stunting prevention program, uh, support local health uh, clinics. Uh, uh, we so far we uh, support three uh, local clinics through capacity building of the local uh, health workers, uh, provide equipment uh, and also medicine. Uh, we also support the government uh, program on 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 uh, COVID uh, COVID vaccines, and then uh, uh, we already. Uh, vaccine, uh, give a vaccine for uh, 800,000, uh, 800 uh, people in the, the villages. Uh, we also install uh, rainwater catchments uh, in the village so they can access to the clean water. Uh, so far, we have 77 uh, rainwater catchment. With our education program, uh, we also access to university for local teacher. Uh, so far, there are 14 uh, local teacher that enroll for uh, for online university and we give them our scholarship with adult education program. Uh, there are uh, 77 uh, adult, uh, adult that participate in this program so they can uh, uh, graduate from elementary, middle school and high school. And then we also have our two school program for children and also literacy program where we uh, renovate the libraries and also uh, give a training to the teacher and also librarian. And also we have a workshop uh, for parents uh, so they can encourage their children to, to love uh, reading. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so in, in, in 2017, uh, the, the project of uh, the project or SMPP uh, secure uh, 5.1 million euro uh, from Atelier Climate Fund in the form of a uh, loan. Uh, which uh, this fund is uh, managed by Mirofa Natural Capital. Uh, uh, the firm uh, used to be called uh, Atelia Ecosphere. Uh, it's found by uh, Christian de Faye. Uh, so, however, uh, closing uh, investment in that size also require uh, significant funds for uh, legal due diligence and then also uh, feasibility assessment, uh, legal drafting, uh, it has amounting cost for 250,000 US dollar. So as a result, we needed to decrease uh, the investment uh, prior to Atelier invest to the project and make the investment uh, less risky. So together with uh, PT Global Alam Lestari is the, the company that holds the, the land license uh, of the project area. Uh, we apply funding uh, to Indonesian uh, foundation, uh, Yayasan Belantara, and we receive uh, roughly uh, 50, uh, 500,000 uh, US dollar in the form of uh, for sale agreement. Uh, so this with this fund is allow us to start uh, the conservation activities and then also secure the asset and, and, and prevent the fire in the project area. And this uh, made our um, business proposal um, more concrete and tangible for the investor, and uh, uh, and show that like we had a team uh, and activities in place. Uh, this uh, initial uh, bridge funding is uh, critical to make uh, investment reality. So further, um, the company also use its own uh, cash reserve, cash reserve uh, to 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 finalize the agreement. And uh, the project uh, finally um, uh, become profitable in 2021 uh, uh, with the sale to the Chanel, L'Oreal, uh, Zalando, BMW, uh, and Microsoft. Uh, and then um, so SMPP model works and the project can pay back loan to Atelier uh, Mirofa. Uh, the project become profitable. As the result, uh, we want to replicate uh, this model uh, to other part of uh, uh, Indonesia. So at the end of uh, 2020, uh, Forest Carbon uh, closed combined debt and equity investment from AXA uh, investment managers. Uh, and these funds are uh, also uh, managed by Mirofa Natural Capital. 
Uh, so with uh, that facility, we can access uh, 9 million US dollar uh, in the form of green bond uh, and AXA is uh, the single or uh, single uh, bond holder. So despite uh, having profitable uh, project and also known by all parties, uh, the investment deal also uh, took roughly uh, 12 months uh, to finalize. Uh, and also very costly uh, due to the legal uh, fees on uh, bond structuring, policy memo, uh, feasibility studies, um, and also negotiation around valuation and, and, and finalizing the, the, the term sheet. Uh, so Forrest Carbon uh, directed uh, all his sources, uh, staff, and also to work on this and also its own uh, cash reserve uh, from uh, profitable consulting. Uh, Forest Carbon also won uh, a few grants, one from uh, Dutch Fund uh, Climate Development, uh, which provide Forest Carbon with 250,000 uh, US dollar in match funding for activities that allow uh, us to, to post uh, to close or to secure investment from AXA. Uh, the FCD also uh, provide us with technical support uh, for feasibility study with their partner, SNV, uh, and totaling is 180,000 uh, US dollar uh, and, and covering primarily community and also biodiversity uh, assessment. Uh, we also awarded facility from US Aid Green Invest Asia that was uh, also 50% uh, match uh, funding for hiring expert to do a uh, policy uh, review and also uh, to prepare a ECG uh, system for the project. Uh, and then also IUCN uh, also awarded uh, some, uh, some uh, funding. So this uh, grant fund uh, reduced the financial risk uh, of forest carbon uh, as its work to close its uh, investment. Uh, however, we also uh, still use our um, fund uh, to, to cover the, 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 the deal. So this slide show on how uh, we uh, use number of fund uh, available out there uh, in order to get investment uh, for from investor. So the lesson learned from the project, uh, the project is a uh, complex and require a multidisciplinary team covering uh, community engagement, forestry, hydrology, um, biodiversity monitoring, tax, legal, and also marketing. Uh, and then uh, community support and understanding are critical. Uh, we have the community intervene to stop the uh, illegal encroachment in, in our project area as, as they happy with uh, our community development program. Uh, so I think for any uh, conservation project, the community are critical uh, stakeholder. The, the social component of the LT program uh, really strengthening my understanding uh, around community rights and the community engagement strategy uh, to ensure a wide range of, uh, of communities' uh, voices are heard. So if we only listen to the uh, local elites, then we can end up designing forest uh, restoration uh, project that further marginalized poor uh, community member. So as a, as a woman, uh, also more conscious to ensure uh, female voices are heard in the project as the result of the LT program. Uh, and also we create a forums where, uh, where women can, can be heard. And uh, another thing is like viable in investment project. So uh, if you want to get investment, uh, you have to provide uh, a clear information about the impact of your project. And then also the legal clarity of the asset. Uh, the investor will ask, uh, who is the asset owner and what type of license. So for example, SMPP, uh, the, our partner, uh, PT Global Alam Lestari, holds a specific license uh, from the government that allow us to do the carbon sequestration and, uh, and carbon storage activities. And then we also have to be able to assess ourselves uh, 
uh, uh, what size of the project that we can uh, manage. So for our uh, project, uh, we uh, we able to uh, to recognize the twenty three thousand hectare uh, degraded peatland. And then we also have to provide financial profile uh, where we uh, provide information about carbon uh, estimation of carbon uh, production and also carbon sales. And then lastly is, uh, yeah, at, at the early state, uh, we need uh, funds to cover the cost uh, for, for, for creating a project part line before investor even consider it. So we rely on, on a grant monies, such as like DFCD, USAID, and IUCN. So our experience, we spend a, a half of million uh, US dollar uh, in one year to, to bring a, a, a new project to, 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 to the investor. But after we got uh, investment from Atelier Mirofa, and also we issue a, a series, uh, so now, like uh, we can cover the early state of development costs. Uh, so, if uh, you want to develop a uh, pitland restoration uh, project, you you must uh, face this stage. Um, yeah. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, I would like to summarize by saying that we can use uh, different type of funds available out there to develop conservation and restoration project. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Mary. Um, it was especially interesting to hear about the variety of sources of funding that Forest Carbon has been able to tap into while developing its, its project sites. So both projects were quite complex and I'm sure our participants have a lot of questions. I'd, li I'd like to now request that all three members of our panel all activate their cameras and microphones and we'll use the next 20 minutes or so to open up a discussion for questions from the participants of the webinar. Right, I took the liberty of already answering two questions in the chat. I hope they're visible for everyone. If not, let me know. And Emma, I think actually one thing that could be nice is if you wanna kind of summarize your answer, since we are recording it, it'll be helpful for the broader audience. Of course. I'd actually like to start with uh, saying thank you for your presentation, Mary. It was really interesting to learn more about forest carbon. Uh, I already knew your name, but now I also saw the impact and it's very inspiring. Um, yeah, so, so, so following Jillian's suggestion, um, you know, I would recommend we kind of return to that issue of monitoring because that's quite an interesting one. Um, the interplay between, uh, you know, ground truthing, LIDAR and the machine learning aspect is, is pretty novel. Yes, of course, I'll, I'll happily explain a little bit more. And Ina, of course, jump in uh, if I miss something. Um, I'm not the uh, satellite imaging remote sensing specialist in the team. However, I've been in it long enough, so I know I can summarize it. Um, but I will also very uh, honestly say if I can't answer a question. So how remote sensing uh, algorithm training basically works is we need to collect a lot of ground truth data. So for each new project, uh, each new eco region and each new uh, type of agroforestry, we collect roughly 100 hectares of ground truth information. And for us, that means on those hectares, every single tree is measured in height uh, and in diameter by hand. Species are recognized. And so we calculate based on elementary equations what the carbon content of all these trees is by hand. Additional to that, we fly over LIDAR. And I don't know if many of you have seen what LIDAR looks like. It's fantastic. It's like a 3D model and the well, the data scientists in our team have really adapted it to a way where we can identify each individual tree and have a 3D model of its size and therefore also another layer of information. Then we correlate that with spatial images. So any sort of satellite imaging and for the training data, we can specifically fly over satellites that have layers that we find interesting. Uh, but for the, the continuous monitoring data. So after collecting all of this, we've trained the algorithm to correlate everything that's been happening on the ground with the geospa uh, geospatial images, especially from Sentinel-2, because Sentinel-2 takes a lot of images year round. It's a very uh, dependable sort of information. The, the um, I would say the coarseness, but that's not the right word. Uh, anyway, it's 10 by 10 meters, which is quite coarse. 
uh, but because we take many different images throughout the year, we can have the sort of we can benchmark for seasonality. You see changes throughout the season, but we really want to know the year-on-year -year growth in biomass. Like I think that was the the second image I showed. And so, uh, with all this information, we uh, have developed models that can, on very small plots, the minimum size is uh, 0.1 hectare, which is really tiny, very diverse ecosystems um, of obviously the different layers of, of growth. We can measure the year on year change in biomass. And uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. I can explain a bit more, but it's already a, a long story, I believe. Maybe to add to what Emma was just saying, uh, for those of you who have not heard of LIDAR, it stands for Light Detection and Ranging, and it's basically laser scanning. Um, so we fly over the trees and basically there's a laser that's scanning the trees. You can't really measure diameter with that, but you can measure height very well, which is difficult to do um, from the ground. Um, so this just as an addition. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Um, and you know, Mary, I, I realize you're legal counsel, and so your expertise might not be in in monitoring. Um, but I did want to give you the opportunity if you wanted to say anything about the monitoring approach uh, in Sumatra. Um, yeah, and if not, uh, that's okay too. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, David. Um, so for Sumatra Marang Pitland, uh, we also use technology like remote sensing uh, for fire prevention and satellite image. And we also using uh, IOT sensor to monitoring uh, the hydrology management in our uh, project area. Uh, so that can send data in real time. Uh, and then uh, we also using camera traps for uh, biodiversity monitoring. Okay, great. Thank you, Mary. Um, Jillian, would you like to ask the next question? Oh, was Emma, were you responding to something? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. there was a follow-up question to the monitoring uh, yeah. in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, it was, uh, I'm looking for it now. Uh, the cost of the ground truth data collection. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, the way I described it. It sounds like a lot of work and it really is. The reason why these types of algorithms haven't been developed yet is because of the high costs of data collection. So training these algorithms to a level that their accuracy is acceptable just takes a lot, a lot of work uh, in, in data collection. And that's, I think, um, why, yeah, why we haven't uh, seen this before in the market, not on, on the small plot sizes or complex ecosystems. And um, yeah, for certification schemes, this was already new as well. So we've spoken with many different certifiers about the plans that we had at the beginning. They all thought we were crazy. And now at this point, uh, we've been officially certified. The methodology has been approved. So in two years time, we've come very far, I would say. But we see other certifiers now as well, adopting remote sensing for ex post credits, uh, which is great news because it, it really opens doors for, for more accurate um, quantification of CO2 sequestered. How much of so those? maybe adding to this, yeah. Emma? Sorry, Jillian. I, I just want to quickly add to this because I think Blaga was was asking more like what what is gonna you know gonna be the cost for the implementation on the ground. So for the ground truth data, it's really hard to give you a figure um, because it's so different in in every region and for every project implementer because it depends on you know how far are these farms away from where you're coming from, what's the fuel price. Um, how much are you paying your enumerators, etc. Um, so it's very difficult uh, to say. We, we have created a list of activities which need to be done um, and, and we're asking the local partners to allocate their own costs. Ground truth and, and LIDAR, everything connected to the algorithms is actually paid for by Rabobank because it's training our own models. Um, so the local partner is responsible for data collection on farm level for all the other farms which will be onboarded. And hopefully that was what you were asking at Blaga. And that was exactly what I was gonna follow up with too of how, what, where the split is in responsibility, both financial and logistic between the, the farmers themselves uh, and the partners on the ground and Rabobank uh, in terms of the monitoring. So that's helpful to know. Um, uh, one thing I found really noteworthy is from both presentations is how 
um, how you guys are in different ways acting as intermediaries between the funders of different types of funders, whether it's corporates or with Mary's project, all different funding sources, and then community groups and people on the ground, farmers and everybody. Um, and uh, one question starting out for Mary is, how do you deal with the different um, monitoring and the different reporting requirements for all of those different funding sources? Uh, yes, thank you, Jillian. Um, we have a team uh, that uh, on monitoring and evaluations and also with the, we already have a template. So uh, of, we create a template. So for example, for investor, uh, we put this uh, report and also different to our donors. So yeah, we have a, a quite team uh, like very strong team on on that on reporting especially, and 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 of course the uh, and data analysing and the stuff. Good to know. So you guys have that in house capacity for all of that. Okay, um, I was going to pose a, a follow up question um, from this is for for both both projects but it has to do with the distribution of benefits. I think for the ACORN project, you mentioned 80 to 90%. Um, Mary didn't mention it, but I do remember at one point, the Indonesian government had uh, basically set some standards about the distribution of benefits between government, smallholders, et cetera. And I'm wondering basically how are these decisions made um, as to who benefits in what way financially from these projects? And of course, there's this inherent tension because this is a, you know, it is a business. And so, you know, on the one hand, you want to help the smallholders, but on the other hand, um, you know, you need to, to pay your employees and, uh, you know, do everything that's required to get this project um, up and running. So thank you all. Open that up to, to both groups. Maybe I jump in because nobody is saying anything. <laughs> so, let me, let me, so you actually uh, already mentioned it, David. So for us, um, out of the guaranteed price that we have of 20 euros uh, at the moment per carbon um, ton of carbon sequestered, 10% go to Acorn for um, uh, maintaining the platform, uh, doing all the remote sensing and for certification. 10% can be retained by the local partner. The local partner is the entity on the ground, basically linking um, the ACORN team and the platform to the farmers. Uh, and 80% um, go to the farmer. Okay, thank you. Mary? Do you Yes, um, uh, David. For the SMPP, uh, we uh, we have like twenty five percent of our expenditure uh, goes to the our uh, community development program. Okay, yeah. and and in both situations, does the government, at whether it be national or some other level, require a certain percentage of the funding? Do they claim any of that revenue in taxes, royalties, or whatever? Uh, for uh, for Indonesia, uh, we pay a uh, levy, a uh, levy, uh, uh, uh -huh. yeah, uh, levy ten percent. Okay. Uh, from the transaction. Okay. About it differs a lot per country what the local mm. laws are around this. So for Acorn, we're really focusing on the countries where we know we can really develop these projects without getting into double counting areas for NDCs, for example, yet with changing laws, uh, well, laws, it's not really law yet, but with changing standards around, for example, uh, Paris Agreement Article 6, you saw after COP26 last November, that a lot more clarity um, was given to what it actually means um, for agriculture, these NDCs, for example. So uh, we keep a very close eye on these types of changes. And we focus for now on the countries where we know uh, we can safely work with these smaller farmers. And Indonesia is a good example because there they have a, a tax, so to say. So any project needs to give a little bit to the government. Other countries deal with it differently. So it's a really uh, 
a tailored job, so to say. Maybe so to add to that, yeah. um, basically what Emma is saying, in those countries where there aren't any restrictions yet, uh, there is no tax or no levy that we're paying for the time being, and we very much hope that it stays that way. Um, at least for as long as the prices are not as high as we would like uh, for them to be. Um, but there are a number of countries that have uh, regulations already in place or about to put them in place. And then, like Emma said, it, it really differs um, from one country to another. Great, thank you. Following up on that, um, there's been some questions having to do with whether the changing uh, standards or priorities from coming out of the COP 26 have um, have had any effect on what both groups are doing. Yeah, I'd happily answer that um, to say it's both good and bad what comes out of it from our perspective. So um, any uh, new clarity on double counting and then especially corresponding adjustments. Personally, I think that's great because double counting has been such a great area between the compliance market. So countries uh, taking care of their own emissions versus the voluntary carbon market. And then also looking at um, supply chain carbon reduction, scope three removals. Those three areas are very, um, it's opaque what happens between them. So double counting is a big risk. However, the choices on the way to, to shape these corresponding adjustments and corresponding adjustments are basically a set of uh, standards for projects to uh, communicate with the, the local government about who owns the credit, very simply put, I think the corresponding adjustments that have been defined so far, so the, the guidelines for that, they need a lot of work still, um, just because uh, it's not too clear what is inside of the scope of the NDCs and what's outside of the scope of the NDCs. So the, nas uh, the national plans for carbon or greenhouse gas uh, reduction do you need to correspondingly adjust for projects that are outside of the scope of the country's NDC? Yes or no, that is still uh, undecided. So that's a, the, the part of the uh, COP26 outcome that we are really struggling with, is how to apply the plans in a way that makes sense for everyone and how to not uh, dupe these smaller farmers in our network. <laughs> that's the biggest yeah, challenge, I would say. But I'd love to hear other perspectives as well, because uh, it, it's a very complex issue. Uh, I think my reading on Article 6, like voluntary uh, uh, market project will contribute to country NDC and doesn't require corresponding adjustment. And uh, at the moment, Indonesia is still uh, preparing the technical guidelines on that. OK. Yeah. So Many probably, countries are doing that. It's not, any of them are not set in stone. So. Great. Um, oh, go ahead, go ahead Julie. Julie. Oh, well, there was a follow-up question kind of, kind of connected to that in terms of the relationship between these types of markets and the government initiatives. Um, so uh, Deanna says, in her country, carbon and other ecosystem services belong to the state and any carbon credit program has to go through Red Plus. Uh, do you have any suggestion on how to develop recognition for carbon sequestration without going through Red Plus? Or ha ha I'll also add to that is um, in the countries in which uh, acorn and forest carbon are working, is there an inherent connection between the state activities and not, um, you kind of mentioned that a little bit with the NDCs, but could you expand how it relates to the ownership and uh, the Red Plus initiatives of the country? Um, I'm happy to give a, a bit of hope there. Uh, so right now, what you see with the COP26 definitions is that um, they're called uh, ITMOs or A6.4 ERs, basically the two flavors of uh, credits that can be traded through the compliance market. Um, A6.4 ERs, I didn't make up the name, trust me, it would be much catchier. Um, they are also tradable uh, outside of national markets. So you can trade them with companies or even with uh, consumers. Those don't recognize Red Plus as a valid uh, accounting mechanism, so to say. So I think uh, if the rules uh, within your country 
um, I'm, I'm guessing I know which country, but if they still want to do either Red Plus or it belongs to the government, then that might be changing based on COP26 uh, to a more, um, let's call it an even more solid definition of what a carbon credit is beyond Red Plus. Um, but the recognition for projects, we really, we struggle to, um, to, to get this on the agenda for these countries, because very often what you see is that if you want to start a new project that the local government says, oh, that's interesting, there's money to be made. We want a piece of it. And that is, um, it's a hard negotiation there because the projects itself, they're not yet too recognized for their benefits for the ecosystem and for smaller farmer livelihoods. So I think that would be the first place to start to say, it's not just money. The money is really a tool to make a transition and where you want to go with that transition is restored ecosystems, uh, regenerated lands, improved livelihoods for smallholders in our case, but it can also be much, much bigger farmers. So that would be my biggest advice. If you want to link carbon to actual benefits beyond uh, income from carbon credits, that's what we are trying to do. And I think so far it's doing great. But again, I would love to hear other perspectives. Um, actually, I don't like to use acronym to describe what we will, our work. I mean, like we are protecting and rehabilitating peatland uh, ecosystem uh, in Indonesia. Uh, we are reducing ambition from avoided uh, plant deforestation and degradation, which is in line actually with uh, the term of red plus. But for our project itself, um, uh, we hold a, a specific license. Uh, from the government, from uh, Ministry of uh, Environment and Forestry that allow us to do carbon sequestration and, and carbon storage activities and also uh, a trade carbon credits from the project. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This has been a great discussion and I'm sure the discussion could go on for much longer, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So we'd like to thank Emma, Ina, and Mary once again for their wonderful presentations. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm, I would suspect that you know if anybody has follow-up questions, perhaps they can you know contact you through email or some other way. Um, if so, you know feel free to put a, an email in, in the chat box. Um, in order to wrap up this webinar series, I'd like to give LT's director, Dr. Eva Guerin, the opportunity to share a few words. So Eva, please go ahead. Sure, thank you so much, David. And thank you to all the presenters today um, for sharing your experiences. It's always so interesting. Um, and I've just learned so much every time, so thank you. And on behalf of the Environmental Leadership and Training Initiative and the Yale School of the Environment, um, I wanna thank everyone who attended this eight part series on forest uh, landscape restoration in practice. So we're really honored to be joined by participants from all over the world to discuss this really important theme um, and to learn from the experiences and the wisdom of our LT alumni. Uh, we're really inspired by the alumni of our program and um, it's wonderful to learn from the projects, from the perspectives and the experience they share during um, the series each month. So learning about their successes and challenges on the ground um, and also their insights about next steps and best practices, it's really essential for trying to achieve restoration results. You know, we're all trying to, to get to a, a certain point and it's very complex. And so having all these perspectives and experiences um, is just invaluable for this process. Uh, we're really grateful for the dedication and innovation that we're seeing with our alumni. Um, and it's a pleasure to hear from them directly and to be able to, to have, you know, listen to you and, and have the effort of the ability to, to discuss um, questions and hear more from you uh, through this webinar. I also want to thank Jillian and David and the entire LT team for uh, organizing and facilitating this really important and unique series. Um, and just want to thank you all again for, for joining us and we're really excited um, for future opportunities to connect and work together, whether it's online or in person, hopefully we'll all be able to go back out into the field um, for those of us who haven't been able to go for the past couple of years and, and see each other in person as well. So a huge thank you, um, lots of gratitude and just really um, 
impressed and, and humbled by everything that you guys are doing. So thanks so much and take care. So as we wrap up, we'd like to share some upcoming learning opportunities. So firstly, learn more about LT's work at our website, which Jillian will post in the, in the chat box. Please click on the events link to learn about upcoming training events, webinars, and other learning opportunities. And we've recently launched the call for applicants to our one-year certificate training program, uh, Tropical Forest Landscape Conservation, Restoration, and Sustainable Use. This is LT's one-year high-touch program where participants engage in four eight-week courses on the fundamental concepts, the human dimensions, the land use strategies, and fundraising aspects of conservation and restoration projects. Additionally, there is a 12-month capstone project course that participants do throughout to relate the content to an actual project in the landscape of their choice. And finally, there is an optional field course once it is safe to do so given the pandemic. We're accepting applications until April 15th. Check out our website here in the chat for all the details and do not hes hesitate to contact us with any questions. Finally, we would also encourage you to sign up for LT's events and mailing list. You can find the sign up box at the bottom of each web page. Also check out our videos on YouTube where we'll also be posting the recording of today's webinar. So on behalf of the webinar organizing committee, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I'd also like to reiterate my thanks to Emma, Ina, and Mary for their great presentations. And we look forward to seeing you again at some future uh, event. So take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so Bye, much. Everyone.